Thank you for being with us tonight, Professor. Very good of you to have me here on this tranquil evening. Tranquility seems to be something you have disturbed among your peers with your remarks on the social order. Did you really mean to say that the aristocracy should be eliminated and all men should be granted equal fortune? Good Lord, those are not my thoughts, but my words taken to extremes. We must recognise there will inevitably be some form of rich and poor people in any society, but if we could find a system of government that would increase the proportion of the middle class and minimise extreme poverty and wealth, then it would be our duty to adopt that system. Thank you for clarifying that revolutionary concept, Doctor. It seems you are yearning for something which many people at your social level feel would never be attainable. A nirvana, if you will. Quite the contrary. I believe a more equitable society is only obtainable but critical to the survival of the realm. There are many concrete steps we can presently take, which will advance the well-being of most citizens. But nirvana is not possible, and its pursuit is a fool's errand. Hoping for an ideal reality instead of trying to understand our current reality leads to useless flights of fantasy, where ideological dogma and baseless wishes replace critical thought. Much of your work focuses on the capacity of land and the effects of population on the well-being of individuals and the viability of a society. We have witnessed some huge movements of peoples in this century and the last. Do these not solve the problems you are concerned with? Migration does not solve problems, it highlights them. People are extremely reluctant to leave their culture, community and nation, and only the most extreme conditions will force them to migrate. What problems do these migrations expose then, and when do they start? Examples of human numbers exceeding the carrying capacity of the land go back as far as documented history can see. This cycle of population boom, environmental decline and population crash will continue to occur until humans change their behaviour. To what behaviour are referring that drives these population cycles? I am noting the tendency of humans to increase their numbers with reckless disregard for the land which nurtures them. Nowhere is this more clearly exemplified than in the colonies in the Americas. In the early years of the American colonies, populations doubled every 25 years. In New England, starting with a population of 21,000 in 1643, it increased by 500,000 by 1760. And on the limits of the frontier, the population was doubling every 15 years, an unheard rate of increase. Why would this growth be reckless or harmful? Endless population growth is harmful because it leads with complete certainty to the destruction of the limited resources our world provides. Let mathematics illustrate this unfortunate reality. If the world population was 1 billion in 1800, the population with 3% compound growth creates the regression of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. to 512 after 225 years, 10 doubling periods. In the same time, substance grows linearly in the form of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. to 10. The ratio of population to resources having started at 1 to 1 would have grown to 512 to 10 after 225 years, hardly sustainable. Further, after 300 years, the ratio would be 4096 to 13 and in 2000 years would be well beyond imagination. A dazzling simple mathematical illustration, Professor. But don't you think an iron law of nature is something that many will always struggle to break? Quite. Intentionally or unintentionally, humanity tests the laws of nature. But it is my duty to point out, we should better understand the laws of nature and attempt to live within them. Progress should come from our own actions, rather than repeatedly failed expectation that nature should adapt to our demands. Thank you very much for your time, Professor. It's a pleasure to be part of this public airing, sir.